we we talked backstage about uh, the fact that we did not have any um, right wing political cartoonists tonight, and I that was for a couple of reasons. One of them is that they're kind of unicornian in their rarity, but also um, I don't know. I just I didn't want to turn the evening into a um, you know, he said, she said, he said, whatever. So, but here's my question to you. Why, are not, why aren't there more right-wing political cartoonists? And feel free to be as slamming as you want. Because <laughs> um, uh, they're not funny. Because <laughs> hating uh, on, uh, you know, defenseless or, uh, you know, people that can't defend themselves or, uh, you know, um, Minority groups, it's not funny. You know, that's their, to me, that, that's why there's no uh, conservative comedians that are funny because mm -hmm. they're, all they do is, you know, I mean, just watch Fox News when they try comedy. You know, it's yeah. just all racist joke after racist joke. And I think it depends, though. I think, it, I, I know of a, I mean, I'll, I'll name a couple who I think are funny, even though I think their views don't align with me. And it depends on where they fall on the spectrum of right wing craziness. And it's, one guy that I met who actually we were discussing a little bit before coming to this is uh, Mike Lester, who's a, a right-wing cartoonist. And as far as his politics, I don't agree at all. But I think he's a great cartoonist and can be very funny. But I think he's kind of you know nuts when it comes to po political stuff. And then Nate Beeler is another guy who does uh, more conservative. I would call him more conservative than right-wing. But mm -hmm. you know, it's like we were talking about uh, about um, Jeff McNally. Yes, was a conservative. But now he would probably be called a liberal. Communist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think most satire has to do with poking uh, power in the eye. That's the mm -hmm. problem for right-wing cartoonists. There's not much that they're inclined to, to poke, yeah. except for you know, powerless people, which is not, as you were saying, not so funny. It's not as funny, yeah. yeah. I always fall back on, um, I heard John Stewart was trying to get pinned down by Terry Gross when he was on her show. She was trying to get him to confess that he was a journalist. And he said, no, 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 what we do is in journalism, we do what we do is in journalism. And he said, look, the reason we fact check and the reason that we do so much work to back up and make sure the humor that we create stands the test of scrutiny is that jokes don't work unless they're true. Hmm. And I always fall back on that. You know, so that, that, to my mind, is why perhaps there aren't as many conservative cars units, because maybe the facts are on their side. Hmm. I think it's anatomical. Um, <laughs> mostly because, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the woman was made from Adam's ribs, so there's a rib tickling, is uh, there's less ribs in males. <laughs> so I think it's easier to, to tickle your own ribs, isn't it? That's a very conceptual response. <laughs> um, do we have any questions from the audience? Raise your hand and someone will come with a mic. And hit you. There she is. So the uh, orange man has responded to SNL, which, you know, in his view is not very funny. Has he tweeted about any comics? <laughs> We're trying to earn that Trump tweet. Yeah. I mean, that would be huge. I, would, I welcome it. That would be amazing. I think well, cartoons they, are probably really hard for him. The one sentence, the one sentence <laughs> caption, his, his attention span doesn't quite make it to the end of the caption. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in the, he got that's really, true. That's he, the, the consensus in the green room before coming up here was that, I mean, we, we mentioned that, that, you know, who's, who's he gonna tweet about first among cartoonists? And that's gonna be very difficult because he doesn't read. So it would have to rise to the level of being on Fox News. So there's gonna be some dust up. It will happen. But I, I think it's only gonna happen once a cartoon gets picked up by cable news. He only watches, yeah, he only watches television. Yeah. I mean, that, that's his entire consumption. I, th um, I think we yeah. should do more uh, captionless cartoons. Just no words. Yes. Yeah, maybe then. <laughs> yes. Then maybe it will entice him to like actually a, uh, read. Like an airplane read. emergency manual or something it, like that. Just all pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like right. an airplane emergency manual. How about over, over there? Uh, how long did it take you to develop your like final cartooning um, style, or are you still working and developing it? <laughs> it's I think, still developing. I think you answered your own question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a never-ending process. You just keep learning, keep doing it, and hopefully one day you, you have, you've actually learned the craft. You can't go to cartooning university to learn this crap. You have to do it. I think it's, I think one thing too, and I, I don't know what, what you guys think about this, but I think 
No. I agree. <laughs> no, that, that personally, it never. I never will stop. I mean, it'll it'll keep developing or get you know better. Hopefully, maybe it'll get worse as I age. You never know. But um, the I think the more interesting thing is how people develop their style initially, and and for me, it was basically trying to copy people whose work I really admired and respected, and then falling way short and developing my own style from that. So it's it's a matter of just you know, seeing what you love and trying to incorporate it in your work. And then for me, it was just, you know, you kind of find your own way eventually. All, all the flaws become your style. All, all the things you're trying not to do, that's your style. That's a yeah. good point. Mm. Yeah, I just think it's really, I think it's important to remain really open to influence, you know, to keep, to keep, be, to be very impressionable and to keep, you know, searching out influences and to remain dissatisfied, you know, with my own style. I don't, when I look back at cartoons I've done, and I just, I don't like them very much and I want to keep getting better. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I'm actually going to copy the, uh, the dumpster fire and the uh, dead canaries <laughs> thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. going that route. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to start doing animation. Actually, Tom, I wanted to ask you, do you draw on paper or on a tablet? Paper. Oh. Yeah, I draw on paper. It's a very laborious process. Yeah. yeah. Paper, then watercolor, and then scan it and then touch up the scan. So I might as well just draw digitally. In the trees. <laughs> yeah. In the trees you're killing too. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Only son. <laughs> you have someone. Uh, I have a, a statement and a question. The statement is um, uh, I could not uh, read the individual signs in the Women's March, but I hope that you're aware of uh, We Shall Overcome. Hmm. And uh, the question, and please forgive me, um, it's, not, it's not a funny question. Where are the women? We tried. There, there is almost no, Lidquake doesn't have a real budget for this series, and so um, the only women political cartoonists that we thought were recognizable enough uh, live not in the Bay Area, so that was a challenge. And unfortunately, the profession is at large, much like our Congress, is not representative. There's very few. Yeah, it's not representative of the population, unfortunately. I mean, there are, there, I know, I, I can only speak on behalf of the New Yorker because I'm just, I sort of know the sort of editorial ins and outs of that a little bit more, but they're, they're making an active push to try and recruit more female artists. And the next editor, the current editor, Bob Mankoff, is retiring in two weeks, and a woman will be taking his place as the cartoon editor. So hopefully that'll mark a shift. Uh, <clears throat> back in the back there. Thank you. Uh, in reference to the last question, at the risk of seeming a bit too guerrilla girl, I am a woman, I am a political cartoonist, and I brought some work for each of the panelists whose work I very much Yay. admire. All right. Yay. The hustle is real. <laughs> it's always what's, what's your name since this is being broadcast live? My name is Ava Crisanti. I'm working on a graphic novel about Howard Levy, who was the second oh, physician thank you. court martial during the Vietnam era. His court martial. Uh, resulted in the GI anti-war movement and his anniversary, he's 80 years old, he's a brilliant man, funny as all get out, um, and he's still practicing medicine in the Bronx, serving the poor, um, serving his conscience, and so uh, mm -hmm. all of you men have inspired me so much, and your work reminds me so much Thank of Domi. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's Thank you. Compliment. Thank you for yes, speaking up. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Dumb, yeah. Dumb, yeah. I'm, I'm sure she'll be happy to Just put some of those out front so people can grab them as they go. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to say hello to the animator, let you know you have a kindred soul in the audience. I'm from Kansas City, raised there, and love it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we moved, we were living in Berkeley. I grew up in El Cerrito, and we moved there two years ago, and really love Kansas City. It's a great town. Yes, I take back all the sneery things I said. <laughs> um, Flip the third. Maybe the lady here one. in the white. Uh, can you hold on while you get the mic there real quick? Well, it, it's for the broadcast. They won't be able to hear you. I'm just wondering if living in Kansas City has influenced your work, because Kansas City, I know, is not as perhaps uh, politically liberal as Berkeley and... Um, San Francisco, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> My partner's from Kansas City also. Um, 
I mean, you know, when I was living in Berkeley, I was drawing in my studio. Now I'm in Kansas City drawing in my studio. So the view out the window changed slightly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a liberal oasis in the middle of red country. So the immediate interactions we have, my wife is a theater director, and that's why we moved to Kansas City, because she's doing a new play festival from, in the KC Rep. Um, so our circle remains artists, progressives, that kind of thing. But you are more aware. I mean, we do... In our neighborhood, there was a lot of Bernie posters, and we lived next to a university, and a lot of students came around and knocked on our doors and asked us to vote for Bernie. But if you go just a few blocks outside, there's a lot of Trump flags flying. So it keeps, it keeps you in perspective, yeah. It gives you a little bit more of a counterbalance. I find that... Oh, we have a bubble here, yes. Okay. I find that almost anywhere in the, in the USA, as long as you're not too far from a campus, a major campus, you find a little bit of Berkeley. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah, mm -hmm. almost any state I've been to, I found, you know, that kind of ferment just because of the the, the campus, sure, kind of opening minds, and so it is an oasis. You, you were mentioning how you're close by the campus. Yeah, 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 certainly, certainly. Yeah, my 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 grandparents have a farm in Ohio near Oberlin, and you go to Oberlin, and it feels all of a sudden very kindred in a way. Yeah, any centers of learning, you find that same feeling as you do in Berkeley for sure. Is, the, yeah. Go ahead. I, I just have to speak for uh, for the right wingers here for a minute. Again, <laughs> here I am doing it again. Jeez, Jeez. I don't know how this happened. I, I snuck in. Um, He's just subconscious. You know, one thing, so so I was born and raised in California, but my mom's side of the family is from Idaho, and that's not the most liberal of states by any means. And so, I mean, I think one of the ways that I was shaped politically and as a cartoonist was the ability to joke with people who you don't agree with and to kind of give them shit and take it back and, and you know, kind of have this rapport and realize that they are not the enemy, but that you can make fun of them and they can make fun of you. And, and I wish there was more of that, but I think we're long past that right now, I, I, unfortunately. Dude, I, I miss arguing yeah. economics yeah. and capitalism with, like... Republicans, what happened to those people? They're gone. There's yeah. just, you know, I am of the, I'm in the punch a Nazi camp, you know? Yeah, the, yeah. the Nazi it's, wants it's me dead. I am at least going to take a couple of his teeth mm -hmm. out, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm nonviolent, but, yeah. you know, if you're calling, you know, I've, I've gotten so much, like, Trump fan hate mail for, I changed my Twitter name to registered Muslim for a little while. And this guy, like, messaged me on Twitter. It's like, I can't wait for Trump to win so we can torture you. You know? And he was not, like, some kind of comedy writer. Joke. He was serious. Some dude in Ohio. Yeah. You know? And then also... You it sure was in Kansas it was a, City? Bo yeah, no. It, it was a bonus for him because then he also wanted to <laughs> deport me, you know? And I'm like, dude, you know, I'm, I was born in San Diego. I'll be back in two hours. I actually live <laughs> near Trump University. Uh, my house is online, so I actually live right next to it. <laughs> <laughs> and I talk to those people all the time. <laughs> They're very nice. Can, Can I say it? one more thing? Kansas City, home of Universal Syndicate, which is now right. Andrews McMill Syndication, which is our syndicator for a, a few of us. You click gocomics.com. You can go on gocomics.com and get like every single comic strip that's out in the universe sent to you every day. You know, because, you know, save a tree or whatever, right? But uh, our, uh, Universal, you know, is, was known for uh, taking chances on, you know, Doonesbury, uh, the Boondocks, um, La Cucaracha, and, and lots of other, you know, very edgy uh, and, uh, you know, out there strips that are not totally mainstream, plus a bunch of mainstream stuff. So shout out to Kansas City yeah. and to Barbecue. <laughs> I'm a vegetarian and I live in Kansas City. I, st oh, I still yeah. support it. Oh, no. It's in the wrong place. <laughs> I actually have a, a quick question for you guys myself, which is it, Tom shared that awful, awful, you know, email or letter that he got that was just so incredibly mean spirited. And granted, as a political cartoonist, you have to have something of a thick skin, but does it ever get to you? I mean, do you ever, um, or do you just have to develop an armor when it comes to this kind of thing? Asmussen, I know, gets all kinds of hate mail. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm emotionally numb. <laughs> well, you kind of have <laughs> Can't to love be. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I try, that's true. Right. Don't even try to love me, okay? <laughs> oh, God. Just stop it. 
<laughs> I mean, it's not pleasant. You don't you don't enjoy it. You know, it's not like the greatest thing to pop up in your inbox. Um, but it's just it's just, it's it's just the sort of it's people who don't feel like they have a voice. You know, trying to express themselves, and we have a platform to express ourselves. And, I've always found that yeah. they. Do you respond to them when you get an email at no, any time? No. No. Oh. I mean, I received that email on the same day I received an email from someone saying, you know, I appreciate what you're doing. I don't agree with your points of view, but, you know, I believe that you should be able to express yourself. And I just wanted to say that. So, I mean, there's degrees to these things. I just chose that one because it was the most heinous and eye catching. <laughs> I've um, always cracked up because sometimes I'll get an email and I don't respond to all of them, but sometimes I'll get a, a really nasty email like that and respond you know, oh, thanks for writing, you know, just something very innocuous. Thanks for writing. Guess we're not on the same side of the fence or whatever. Add them to your email. And, and then they'll just come back and they'll be like, oh, oh my wow. gosh, I, I'm so sorry <laughs> yeah. I sent that. Yeah, I just yeah. needed to get it off my chest. So a lot of it's like that. And, and honestly, it's, it's for me thing, anyway, yeah. I don't know about you guys, but it's, it's, I, I always write, since... thank you for your readership. Yeah. <laughs> <Thank you very laughs> there you go. That's good. <laughs> I, because I those people that write me, I mean, they, they read my strip every day and then write me a nasty message. And I'm like, I, keep, I have, yeah, either keep, keep boosting my numbers. I have the opposite experience where I get a lot of love mail and then I send back really hateful <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and then they send hate mail. And then you love them. And then yeah, like, I don't know. It's weird. It's yeah, abusive it's, cycle. it's abusive. It's an abusive cycle, yeah. Do we have uh, any more audience? Question. There's a man that's been raising his hand right there. Uh, for those of you who work closely with editors or in, in, uh, on a daily or weekly basis, I'm just curious, with the change in the political climate, has there been a change in your editors' views in the sense of there are lines that they didn't want you to cross before that now are kind of freewheeling or are they concerned about, you know, you may want to do something very uh, uh, vocal and uh, very, very strident and they're saying, well, maybe not. I'm just kind of curious. Had, or is it just business as usual? I think it was worse under Obama, actually, believe it or not, because there was a sense of protecting the guy. You know, he's, he's our first African-American president. You can't really uh, say certain things. He means well. Whereas now it's, hey, fire away. We all hate Trump. So it's uh, <laughs> ironically, it's, it's my, my experience is the opposite. My, my editor just checks for typos, <laughs> and they, you know, she. They, I've never had an editor that's like told me not to do anything. Yeah. They don't do that. The Chronicle doesn't allow scrotum anymore. <laughs> because of you? Yeah, you I, mean, I had a whole you, thing of scrotum of jokes going for weeks, <laughs> and they finally stopped me. You have the word or there the is, There is such a thing as too much. Scrotum. I did not know there was such a thing as scrotum jokes. Okay. Oh yeah, it's a, it's on the uh, what do they call that Reddit? It's okay. Scrotum. <laughs> <laughs> Google Asmussen scrotum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Images. <laughs> no. <laughs> I refuse. What are you gonna? I'm only like for me personally, I'm only restrained by you know the New Yorker's top hat and white gloves. They don't they don't let you go so far. I mean, I had some. Sample Trump 2020 re-election campaign posters that I wanted to put up on the website, um, and they nixed the ones that were like two nooses as the O's, <laughs> and then uh, KKK hood with the eyes as the O's 2020. So you can't you can't cross those lines on that platform. Although David Remnick, the editor, is very much obviously opposed to Trump, and he you know has called you know our sort of a state of emergency the way that Trump called the news media the enemy of the people. And so he's letting the journalism, I think, take the vanguard of that resistance, and the art still has to stay more of it sort of humorous. You know, a scrotum can make the uh, letter W. <laughs> <laughs> Was that during the Bush era? Was that you found that out? <laughs> there you go. Google Asmussen scrotum Bush era. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, this is really going downhill. <laughs> uh, maybe one more question, this man up here. Does anybody have a... Oh, I'm sorry. There's a man with the mic back there. Hold on one second. Uh, so my question is about um, your process and how many, how many strips, how many cartoons we, we don't see that mm. you've created. <laughs> Be thankful you don't see those ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm kind of a weird case because for me, once I start producing the thing, I've got to finish it, because otherwise it's, I, I don't think ever, yeah, I've, I've never actually created an animation and not, you know, released it. 
somehow. But I do actually now, you know, kind of calling back to the last question too, I have a foot in both worlds a little bit now because I do a, a daily still cartoon with uh, KQED here as well that's out on social media, but is very different from my animation, which is a little more to the jugular. It's more in the New Yorker genteel style, <laughs> I'd like to think anyway. You, do you do awesome. one a week or of the animated? or I do one, yeah, one a week of the animated and then a daily yeah, of the... That's a lot. Man. It's crazy. Yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it works, though. You know, that's where motion capture will hopefully save my behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dra it'll be drafts and drafts and drafts, you know, of, of just refining. For me, for me, it's mostly refining the caption, getting the wording exactly correct, you know, go agonizing over that is where I do most of the editing for my jokes, yeah. I actually included preliminary sketches of a lot of the ones you see and other Trump cartoons in the book, if you want to buy the book. <laughs> for me, you get all my crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway. The Chronicle uh, laid off all the editors, so I don't get it at all. <laughs> <laughs> just, you are the Chronicle. Good. And that's it. Yep. You're it. <laughs> the last one there. I spelled <laughs> scrotum wrong, and that was, that was why. That. <laughs> they, never, they never told him the Chronicle folded. He thinks he still works there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Don, two words. Yeah. Scrotum capture. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> okay. Last question. You, you guys... Are, are proof that uh, <laughs> that it's it's not a good idea to uh, adjust to a uh, an unjust world, especially you, <laughs> um, Mark. I just I, I've heard f from the others um, how what else they do, but I'm wondering how do you make how do you make a living by this? <laughs> <laughs> very very carefully. <laughs> It's, well, it's a variety of things. I mean, in, I used to, when I first started doing animation, I basically started selling the animation the same way I was selling print cartoons before that. You know, knocking on editors' doors and, and essentially self-syndicating, which is how I'm still doing it. Self-syndication, a little bit through Patreon, I don't know, it's, which is basically like a, an ongoing crowdfunding thing like Kickstarter. So it's, it's starting to, at least the writing on the wall for me anyway, has started to bypass those editors and go directly to people who, who like my stuff. So while I might not have a book, I do have a, a Patreon campaign. So you, you know, people can go there and it, you, you essentially, you, you get the cartoon, but you also can see behind the scenes and get more bells and whistles that way. So it's, it's a variety. And then also doing uh, the, the daily cartoon with KQED as part of it too. So yeah, it's, 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 it's you know, working for yourself. It's entrepreneurial juggling, something like that. <laughs> did winning a Pulitzer help? And how do you win a Pulitzer? It did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, when I first started to, I sound like a really old fart now, but when I first started to apply, uh, they didn't accept animation. They didn't accept online entries. And so I essentially uh, did a, a fuck you entry for like three years, four years. And I would, after like a week after I submitted it, I would get a call, you know, hi, this is blah, blah from Columbia University uh, calling about your entry. And my heart's like, oh my gosh. And, and then they say, do you want us to uh, mail back your entry or should we just throw it out? Uh, so, so persistence. And then they finally changed the rules and, and uh, it, it helped a little bit, but it wasn't, it's so not So hate like mail works ticket. is what you're saying. Yeah, hate mail. Hate mail is more important. Hate mail works. But, <laughs> but a big part of it, I'm sure for all of us here, is that with uh, the, the exposure you get, you get you know, a request from all sorts of places. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you, you don't just do your daily thing, you also do extra projects. And so between all those things, you manage to make a living. I'm a Hollywood whore. <laughs> <laughs> and it's working out pretty well, it sounds like. <laughs> Can't get much In better Emeryville, than Pixar. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to, uh, we need to wrap it up because the library has very firm hours that we need to be gone. Um, I wanted to tell you that our next one of these wonderful panels will be on uh, May 31st. That's the one that we mentioned earlier called Such a Nasty Woman. Uh, female authors respond to Trump and we'll have um, some amazing, uh, the amazing novelist Christina Garcia, Carolina de Robertis, Aya de Leon, Vanessa Hua, um, and more. 
And so I encourage you to, to respond to that and to RSVP and please come out. It's free like all of these are. And I want to thank our amazing, amazing panelists tonight. <laughs> Yeah. Welcome. As well as the San Francisco Library, Joan Jasper, Joan Jasper and her crew and her wonderful sound people. Please uh, go to litquake.org for future happenings and thank you so much for coming.